From the City of Rancho Mirage Cultural Commission and the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory, this is Curiosity Trap, the show about the fascinating subjects, people, and institutions that spark a special interest in our audience. We explore things you've always been curious about by going deep with experts and icons that represent our collective cultures and connect our diverse community. Get ready to get trapped in a world of discovery and insight available nowhere else. Pickleball is one of the fastest growing sports in the world, with new players picking up a paddle every day. And Rancho Mirage resident Roger Belair is one of the game's most enthusiastic supporters. It's where Roger has chosen to focus his passion for promoting and teaching pickleball that is now changing lives for those most in need of something new and positive to focus on. Join us as we hear the fascinating story of Roger's journey to becoming a true pioneer of prison pickleball. Roger, thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, we're super uh, happy to have you and um, to learn about your story. Uh, let me just start by saying that your story, Roger, is probably one of, and I've got to interview some really interesting folks for this show, uh, the rest of our team has as well, and uh, the research for yours was probably the most fun that I've had. That's what everybody says <laughs> about pickleball. I have a very easy subject to work with. <laughs> well, let's start, I want to get to pickleball, but can we start with you. I'd like sure. to hear a little bit more about your life. Um, you know, where, where are you from? Where did you grow up? I'm from uh, Eastern Washington originally. And then I went to school at Washington State University. And after graduating, I ended up in the banking business. And one of the th first thing I learned about being a banker is you're around a lot of money, mm -hmm. but not much of it goes into your own pocket. Uh, so I I had a desire to create a certain amount of wealth, or, and, and I wasn't really driven toward consumerism, but having uh, some money gives you options. Mm -hmm. And so I started dabbling on some investments on the outside, um, particularly called discount mortgages, and it worked out fairly well. And then I ended up with some publicity that changed my life. A stringer for Money Magazine contacted us and said, what do you do? We're always looking for unusual stories. And my business partner and I ended up on the front page or the cover story of Money Magazine. Wow. And I received a number of contacts from around the country. One of them was, one of them was from Doubleday. And they said, have you ever thought about writing a book? And so I sat down with what's called a typewriter, P-R-S, you know? I think I, remember, I think I may have seen one of those. <laughs> And the book came out, and it sold quite well. They were surprised. I was surprised. And um, and this was on finance? This was on finance, how to invest in discount mortgages. Okay. All right? That was a topic. By that time, I'd left the banking business, and I was asked to write a second book for the business community on how to borrow money from a banker. And my personal investments kind of took care of my standard of living, and I had a lot of fun with that. But after about 1990, I, my first book came out in 84, the second in 86. Uh, I kind of done enough of that. All right, so where does pickleball enter into your life then? In my life, I started playing about 10 years ago. Okay. I, f I fell in love with it. Yeah. I mean, most people do. I mean, now I teach around the country, but uh, you just love the game, and so, I came coming from uh, a speaking background, and I like to tell people what to do. So I started giving clinics. First of all, local at the local for the city of Edmonds, and then it kind of expanded from there. What was the first time you ever played? Were you just at a park and saw people no, playing? No, what or? I did was uh, I walked to a health club, okay, and to try to stay in shape. And they offered pickleball, and I said, "Well, you know, I'd heard about it." Because I'm, this, I live just north of Seattle, and the game was created on Bainbridge Island, which is outside of Seattle in 1965. So I've heard the name a couple of times. I had no idea what it was. What, you know, what kind of game can it be? It was called pickleball. Um, so I tried it, and, and I just fell in love with the game. So look, tell us a little bit about pickleball. And you said you know a little bit about how it was developed sure. and how it got the name. Well, I ended up being a pretty good friend of the founder. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and what happened was a guy by the name of Joe Pritchard, and you might recognize that name because he later served in Congress. 1965, he's on Bainbridge Island. He's out playing golf with a buddy, Bill Bell. He comes home, and the kids are whining. There's nothing to do. I'm bored. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to Seattle and see my friends. And so Joel said, you guys go out back and, there's, and, and play some badminton because they had a court back there. Mm -hmm. So the kids get out there and they set up everything and they can't find the birdies. Well, about that time, Dickie Green, age 13, is walking down the street with a wiffle ball and a plastic bat. And they take the ball and they start trying to hit it over the, the net. Well, that doesn't work with a badminton racket. So they went down to my friend Barney McCollum's garage, grabbed some ping pong paddles, and that was the start of the game. They thought they had a winner because everybody who played it really enjoyed it. And there's some real benefits to the game that mm -hmm. we can talk about in a minute. So what they tried to do is they said, let's go to Spalding, let's go to Wilson, let's go to athletic uh, trade shows and market the game. And basically the feedback was, geez, you, you got a wooden paddle here that's five bucks, you got a, a wiffle ball that's 50 cents, there's no money to be made by selling this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, the manufacturer says, we, we, we'd rather sell tennis shoes, mm. all right? So during the 60s, 70s, they, in 72, they formed Pickleball Inc., which was a company to promote the game and sell equipment. 80s, 90s, not much happened. I mean, the, there was a few loyal followers. I talked to a reporter for the Boston Globe here recently, and he was doing some research. The headline came out in, the, in his paper is pickleball is growing at an almost unprecedented rate in the history of American sports. That's the headline. You can read it online. Wow. Two days ago, the New York Times came out, is pickleball ready for prime time? That's the headline. So I played it in, in PE class in high school. Right. And I wonder if at some point that the group was, went, was trying to get out in, into the schools as a way, or, because I think there's other people that I've talked to that played it in, in school, school as well. If it hadn't been for the schools, the, the sport would have probably died. Oh, really? PE teachers liked it for the same reason that the sports manufacturers didn't. It was cheap, mm -hmm. all yeah. right? And so they, they, they marketed to schools and they had some success. I think where your story has become fascinating to so many people is what you have been able to do with this sport to affect uh, people who are in prison. And yeah. tell us how you even started on that journey. Um, I know you'd seen a, a story, I think, on 60 Minutes about uh, the prison in Cook County near Chicago. Well, it's, it's very interesting the way life takes twists and turns. I was playing the game, I love the game. My wife and I often watch 60 Minutes. Mm -hmm. And they had a story, Leslie Stahl did, on Cook County Jail, and in particular, Sheriff Tom Dart, who tries to run this place. Well, as Chicago's a unique place. They have more homicides in Chicago than New York City and LA combined. Mm -hmm. but they have 90,000 to 100,000 people that flow through there every year. They have a standing population of 8,000 people. And I'm watching this segment, and most of these men and women are just sitting around. They're playing cards. They're talking. They're not doing much. You can imagine the challenges that they have. And, and so I said to my wife, I said, they should be playing pickleball. They'd be getting exercise, and of course, exercise is good for all of us, but they also would be learning life skills like Thinking about consequences, learning from mistakes, become a better teammate. I'm going to write Sheriff Dart a letter and tell him exactly what I think. I'll go back there. I, and my wife said, not so fast. <laughs> that, that, you know, I, don't, I hope you're not disappointed if you don't get a letter back. But what makes you the type of person who is watching a news story and says, I, I could... I could make a difference there. I guess I'm somewhat of the out, outside the box thinker. Mm -hmm. And I saw that and it was a natural reaction for me watching these people and I knew very little about the criminal justice system at that time. Mm -hmm. But I've learned a great deal since that time. And that was my, just kind of my gut reaction is here's something that would benefit those people. So 
you go in there and you bring this this thing that is a fun thing. That, and, and, you know, one of the, I guess, parts of prison life has always recreation of some kind, right? Or it hopefully would be. Um, usually basketball, maybe, weightlifting. You're bringing something new. How did you go about that? I thought what I'd do before we went in the gym is give them a little background, kind of like what we've talked about. Mm -hmm. Here's how the game started. Yeah. Here's why people enjoy it. And um, so I was introduced, and they had no interest. Really? Yeah. They, they had absolutely no interest. They just think it sounds silly? or No, just... no. Arms were crossed. Uh, they were looking around the room. They w I wasn't making eye contact. And... Um, I was nervous before I started. I was more nervous now. And I, I realized three things. I realized they're from Chicago. I'm not. Okay. They were all young. Most of them, almost every one of them was under 30. I'm not. And the third thing I realized is I have a good life. I live in Rancho Mirage. I live outside of Seattle. That's my bubble. Mm -hmm. All right. For them, every single day of their life is trying to survive. On the inside, it's a matter of intimidation and violence. And you never know when violence is going to break out. So I knew that things weren't going well. I didn't know quite what to do. I didn't know if that night I'd be coming back from Chicago to Seattle. So not really knowing what to do next, I cut my presentation short. And I said, let's go to the courts. And I would say it probably took five minutes. Five minutes from their point of view of having absolutely no interest in anything I had to say to a 180 degree transformation of listening to every single word. They turned into kids on a playground. For them, being out on that court, the world went away. They weren't thinking about themselves. They weren't thinking about their problems. They were simply thinking about a plastic ball and hitting it over the net. Hmm. How long you were there for a week? I was there for a week. Uh, yeah, four or five days. Were you seeing you know the same kind of group of guys every day, or multiple groups? And then how did sort of the week progress? Like multiple you know. groups. The word quickly spread of, don't pay attention to what the name of the game is. This is fun. Yeah. And you're going to enjoy it. And, of course, they'd sit around and they'd talk. So, uh, but I trained a number of people over the week. I worked with some women groups as well. I've been to Chicago three times. The last time I walked in, I felt like a rock star. Roger's here, everybody. High fives. Um, I felt like Santa Claus walking into grade school. Wow. But what's interesting about that third time is there was a reporter for USA Today, a mm -hmm. sports reporter. And he was going to write a piece for the sports page. So he interviewed me. He interviewed, of course, uh, some of the staff. He, he interviewed, uh, the, they're actually detainees until they're convicted. They're, they're charged with a crime. He called me up a couple days later and said, uh, it's not going to run on the sports page. And my heart dropped. You know, I th I, you know, you immediately say, why are they pulling this story? I thought it was a good story. And, um, you know, I was really looking forward to it, and now they're not going to run it. And then he added, the editors are, are so impressed with the story, they're going to run it on the front page. And they did. It's wow. a main story on the front page of USA Today. Wow. What, what? That must have been a good feeling, I would think. Incredible feeling. You know, how many times has something like that happened to somebody in, in their life? And anybody can pull it up online. Just Google Pickleball and, and USA Today. But what, there's two things are, that's really important about that piece. So, you know, they had pictures of us and, and playing. And the two things I like to point out about that article is the first one is from Jim Edmondson. He's in charge of athletics or something along that line. He coordinates the activities. Mm -hmm. But what he says in the piece is disciplinary problems are down. Guys know if they don't behave, they can't get out on the court. And they'd play at 3 o'clock in the morning if they could. All right? 
So how incredibly wonderful that you can use a carrot rather mm -hmm. than a stick to reduce the problems on the inside, right? That surprised me, but I'm gonna tell you, what I'm gonna tell you next surprised me a heck of a lot more. If you pull up the piece, you can see me sitting on the bench with a guy by the name of Clarence, and he's charged with attempted murder. And what he tells me as that picture is taken, he says, Roger, look out there on the court. You have people from opposite gang members playing together. They're laughing together. Some of these guys wouldn't even talk to each other mm -hmm. before pickleball. And now look at them. I had no idea. Because you didn't necessarily know the goings on behind the scenes and the... No, no. You know. I, you know, I didn't know that. I mean, we don't really have gang activity in Seattle or Rancho Mirage. But in the large um, cities, it's a major problem. Like I said, there's 55 major gangs mm -hmm. in, 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 Ch in Chicago. But when I came out at the end of that week, I looked back at that sign, and I realized how much I had learned about what life was like on the inside. The first thing I learned is most of those individuals never had much of a chance. They grew up in poverty. Mm -hmm. They grew up in a ch probably a challenging household. Mm -hmm. They had few role models. The role models that they had, and the, probably the people they respected the most were older kids in the neighborhood. Well, that's just code for saying gang members. Mm -hmm. And for an awful lot of these kids, it's not a matter of if they're going to join a gang, it's a matter of which gang are they gonna join for safety. Mm -hmm. yeah. The second thing I really learned was how much mental illness there is on the inside. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. You can tell just by sitting down and talking to a lot of these guys that they're just not quite tracking with you. You know, it's not, it's not really appropriate to say to somebody, uh, uh, this has been charged with a crime or is in prison. You know, what'd you do? Why are you right. here? It's a little bit like maybe say, asking somebody their age. Sure. They might tell you the truth, they might not. They might be offended, they mm -hmm. might not. But I'm sitting there on the sidelines talking to this one individual and relating particularly well. It's a neat kid. I mean, 25 years old. And all of a sudden the words just popped out of my mouth. You know, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. He gave me an honest answer. He said, I'm bipolar, I was off my meds, and I didn't mean to kill him. Wow. How many lives were impacted because of that? Mm -hmm. Very sad. I think those are two of the things that people don't always understand about the folks that end up in our prisons. And it, it's easy to, to ignore those things if you're not in those situations, if you grew up in an environment and had the stability and the values and the access to health care that these guys yeah. haven't had. Yeah. Well, you're absolutely right. You know, we all live in a bubble. And that bubble is what we call our life, and we think that other people live the same way, and whatever that bubble is. Well, they have a bubble too. Mm -hmm. their, 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 their bubble is on the streets, and, uh, you know, a couple years later, I was teaching, well, uh, it doesn't matter which prison, and a kid said to me, he said, were the, were the people that created this game rich? When he asked me that question, I had to pause for a moment, and certainly by his values, they were rich, and so I said, yes, they were. He said, I knew it. Only rich people have the opportunity to sit around and think of something like a game sure. like this. Yeah. All the rest of us, me and the brothers, we're just trying to survive. How did you end up going to other, other prisons then? Because I know you've been to some other prisons as, sure. as well. So you sure. had that first experience and then kind of what happened from that point on? Well, you know, that was the, the initial one. But of course now when that article came out, I had something to provide other prisons mm -hmm. as far as here's what's going on in Chicago. All right, I ended up going back to Rikers Island in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, Rikers Island is a jail for New York City. It's on a separate island. 
And there's actually 10 different facilities that they have back there. You know, one for new arrivals, one for women, one for people leaving, you know, that type of thing. I was back there for a week and trained about 100 detainees and probably about 25 staff members. And at times, I wasn't sure if somebody was, you know, a staff member or, or, they, mm -hmm. or, or they were an overnight guest. Um, it went extremely well. And, and after I let, left, the deputy commissioner, I was told, ordered pickleball equipment for all 10 sites. Do you teach um, whoever's in charge of recreation or do you, how to, I mean, I guess it's simple enough that once a couple people know, they can kind of teach right. another few yeah. people and it just sort of goes on from there. That's, that's exactly right. You know, I have my own system down uh, because I've done it so much, but it's not a hard game to learn. Mm -hmm. And, and, and after I left, certainly the people that are still playing the game, the equipment was all donated and, and they can just teach others how to play. Have you heard stories from the prisons that you've been to? Is there anything that has st stuck with you or, um, you know, that you always kind of think back on? I mean, you've shared some of those, but is there any maybe we haven't talked about yet that stand out? The story that comes to mind was when I was in Chicago. Now, now what happens is inside a prison you have all these hard surfaces. So you can see a picture of like a gymnasium and what you don't recognize is how noisy it is. I mean, because everybody's screaming. And, and that's just kind of the norm. And so I'm teaching and there's this uh, detainee that comes to me and he looks like a NFL lineman. I mean, 320 pounds. Agile, he screams something in my ear. Um, I scream back, what? He screams back again, the, the question he has, kind of like, well, what happens if it hits the line? Is that in or out or something, something like mm -hmm. that? He goes back out and plays. A um, couple of minutes back, he's back with, uh, um, with another question. So he screams at me, I scream back at him. He goes back out playing and then a couple of minutes later, a guard comes over. And he says, excuse me, Roger, but were you talking to him? Well, I didn't know how to answer that. Of course I was talking to him. He says, well, he's been here for a month. He's never said one word to anybody. Wow. We didn't know he could talk. Now, I'll give you a footnote to that story. This guard was from the Bronx. It's easier for me to understand the other guy than it was. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he didn't grow up this kid didn't grow up in, in uh, the United States. I, I don't know if he was from Poland or someplace in yeah. Eastern Europe. But that was, he needed to know. He, well, he wanted he, to know, yeah, he, yeah what happened? Yep. And he, he was good. He, he, he had a lot of coordination. He played, uh, I talked to him later and he said he played a lot of ping pong growing up. Okay. I know you can kind of play, you know, you can set up like you were saying in a gym or whatever, but if there are, is public facilities, you're obviously gonna get more people interested. Yeah. And is that kind of happening right now? You know, we, um, baby boomers really started the momentum on this thing going. And one of the statistics is, is in 2003, we, there was 39 known public places mm -hmm. around the country to play. And now it's over 10,000. And it's going to be, for long, it's going to be 50,000 or maybe 100,000. Because the benefits of the game, you don't need a large piece of real estate. It can be played in a conference room. It can be played on a tennis court. It can be played on a cul-de-sac. And it's, it's, it's very inexpensive. So, so you do think it's kind of the baby boomer retirement that made it blow up? Well, it's exposure. Yeah, and the ex it's, it's absolutely exposure. But look at the benefits, you know, um, First of all, you can learn this game in an hour. All right, it's not that hard. There's mm -hmm. only three basic rules. And you compare that to other sports. Um, well, like golf, I've been trying to learn golf for 40 years, <laughs> right. right? I still don't know how to play it, Yeah. okay? Um, you know, so, so that's one thing, but you can learn it in an hour. The second thing is great exercise, but at the same time, it's easy on the joints. Uh, tennis is a great game, but after you reach a certain sure. age, it's really hard on the joints. Yeah. And you know, here's a, here's a sport where you can get great exercise, 
I like to call it ping pong on, on steroids because you have a, a court that's about a third the size, a fourth the size of a, of a tenor, regular tennis court. All right. It's very inexpensive. Paddle you can get for 75 bucks. Mm -hmm. It will last you several years. A ball is three or four dollars. It's very social. In talking to Barney, one of the founders, we once had a conversation. He says, I don't know of any sport that's more social than pickleball. And here's why. A game is played to 11. You're usually on the court for about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You play with those people. You get off the court and you go to the sidelines. The next four people come in. Hmm. All right? Is that so, kind of the etiquette on the that, court? That's, like well, it, if it's well, a in, crowded in, day? In, in most places. What ha happens is you'll have more people on the sidelines than you do on the courts. Really? Yeah. I've been down to, to Florida, and there's been 50, 75 people on the sidelines before they open. Wow. All right? And people will hang out because they know they're going to get a chance well, before sure, too long. Well, sure. Sure. That's, that's exactly right. And so it's not one of those things where you want to play some pickleball and you've got to line up other people like you would normally in tennis uh -huh. to, to play. You just show up at the courts. I had no idea about that. Yeah. yeah. I would have thought you always needed to have your group no, and everything. No, no. You just show up. Well, what happens is you show up and a couple of days later and you got the same people there. So mm -hmm. you get to know these people, and it's always on a first-name basis. And it doesn't matter if they live in the penthouse or they live in a studio apartment. Mm -hmm. You get to know them, you, you like them, and, and, and there's so much incredible social interaction about this, this sport. And, and isn't that terrific in this day and age where so often people are just looking in their phone or are looking at right. the screen, all right? Absolutely. But think about it. There, there's no other sport that, that is, is this social. Mm -hmm. But the number one reason that people like to play this sport is because it's just plain fun. So locally here, you were telling me, has had quite an impact with the, an, you said an agreement was just signed with the, the tennis gardens in Indian Wells to right. have. They have the nationals, mm -hmm. all right? And I forget the number of, I don't want to say because I can't remember the number of players they, they had, but there's two major tournaments. One is right here in Indian Wells and the other one's in Florida, but there's Pickleball players, many of them want to play in tournaments. So I don't even keep track of the number of tournaments there are around the country right now. But they're very popular, and people go, and they have a great deal of fun. Do you think it has staying power? I mean, I, I, I'll tell you, I played um, roller hockey in the 90s. <laughs> it was, it? And it got huge because rollerblades came yeah. out. And I, yeah, I traveled all over the country playing as yeah. a teenager. Yeah. Um, and now, you know, there's still pockets here and there. But it kind of died out. Do you think pickleball is a sport that's going to be around for a long time? You know, without question. All right, because of the benefits, so many people that can do it. All right, and it's easy on the joints and it's fun, mm -hmm. it's social. Recreational sports, some are terrific, like golf, but look how expensive yeah. it is. People love it. I, I've, as many people have I taught, so many times, or occasionally what we'll do is we'll do a survey afterwards. For 100 people that, that take instruction, 90, 90 out of that 100 want to play again. About seven or eight say, I, I'd love to, but I, you know, it's too hard on my knees or mm -hmm. my feet or whatever. And about two or three people will say, it's just not for me. Well, look at those statistics. That's pretty incredible, right. yeah. It, it's, so it's, yeah. We know it's grown exponentially in the last 20 years. The prison portion of it that you've brought in, do you see that growing oh. in the prison population? Oh. I know COVID has sort of put this weird pause on things, yeah. but um, I mean, do you really see it as a thing where prisons potentially not only here, but all over the world could institute pickleball? You know, if, 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 if you can reduce violence on the inside, if you can improve communications. I was talking to a friend yesterday and we were talking about in our very polarized world today about how a corporation will have sensitivity training. And it doesn't matter what the topic is, but you have sensitivity training. And so you, you bring in people that have different points of view mm -hmm. and everybody knows um, kind of to say the right thing. Mm -hmm. And hopefully at the end of the day, you've made some progress about creating awareness, whatever the topic is. You contrast that with two groups of people that for whatever reason, they won't even talk to each other. They come together for an activity, whatever the activity is, 
and they'll not only talk, but they'll laugh together. Mm -hmm. You just have to believe that some progress is going to be made out of that yeah. situation. Yeah. All right? And so I go back to what I told you earlier about Chicago, and I, I, I never expected anything like that to happen, but how, how incredibly wonderful that you can have opposite gang members who actually hate each other be willing to spend time on the court together and play together and laugh together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't be in, in, in every state and probably in most prisons um, and, 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 and jails. You, you have in the prison system, you have the states and then you have the feds. And I've heard from the feds and they're saying, we got it. You know, we haven't, we haven't gone down that path yet, but as soon as COVID permits, get a hold of us. Mm -hmm. and we're going to open it up. I hear from probably somebody once a month that says, I've read about what you're doing inside prisons. I want to join. I want to get involved. How do I get involved in doing this in my state? Mm -hmm. Roger doesn't need to be there in person to teach people how to do it. But what I can do is help them develop a game plan on how they get on the inside. I can give them some of the articles that have happened about me, some of the resources, some of the letters that I've received from wardens, and, and to help to open doors. And so there's an absolutely no doubt that it's going to get big. It's going to get huge. It's going to get phenomenal in size. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how that's going to happen or how soon it will. And right now, the, you know, the, the, the hurdle is COVID. Yeah. But, but that's starting to come together. Well, we've appreciated having you. Thank you so much for your time. And I uh, look forward to seeing you out on the courts. Great. We'll do that. All right. Sounds good. Bye.